Well, here we are on the last Sunday of 40 Days of Waiting, and guess what? We're all still waiting for things, uh, and that's just the nature of being alive, I think. Just in our own small group, we've got um, one person who's waiting for a job, who's applied for jobs and, and not got them, and still waiting for that to come through. And someone else who's waiting for the results of medical tests. Uh, and of course, all of us are, are waiting for the end of the, the COVID crisis, just waiting for this to be over. And yet it continues. Well, as we've gone through 40 days, we've looked at two Old Testament figures who waited. Uh, Joseph, of course, uh, during the Sunday mornings. And in midweek, if you're in a small group, we've been looking at Moses. Um, and what I want to look at today is the way their stories ended so differently. Now, Joseph got what he was waiting for. Do you remember early in his story, through his dreams, God had promised him a position of influence. And at the end, after many trials and difficulties, Joseph did arrive in that position. But Moses never got what he was waiting for. He was waiting uh, for 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites, millions of people, to lead them into the land that God had promised. And yet Moses never got to enter that land. Uh, and we're going to look at that in a bit more detail in, in this week's uh, small groups. Now, he was on top of the mountain looking down over the land, but died before he could enter it. So what I want to ask at the moment is, is who do you identify with? Do you feel like a Joseph who waits and waits and gets the thing that has been promised? Or do you feel more like a Moses who never got the thing that he waited for? And if you do, what can you do with that? Now, a lot of us, I think, will identify more with Moses. And the thing is, Moses isn't an isolated instance. Uh, if you look at the Bible, lots of people never got the thing that they were longing for, that they were waiting for. All of the Old Testament prophets, for example, and their writings take up about half of all the Old Testament, they all glimpsed the grace of God, his goodness to his people, but never got to see it clearly. And Jesus himself explains this in Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 13 and verse 17, he says this, I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Why? Peter lays it out in more detail in his first letter, chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, he says this, This salvation that God has given us was something that even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. In some ways, that must have been really frustrating. And I think we've all had experiences like this where we feel that God has shown us a glimpse of something and we're waiting for it, but we haven't seen the full thing. This is why you 2s song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, resonates so strongly. You know, that's it's an old song now, I guess, 25 years old, yet you still hear it a lot. And it's because it, it, it I think it, it tunes in to this feeling so many of us have. So I want to look particularly closely today at one example of someone in the Bible who didn't get the thing that he was waiting for, and that's Abraham. Uh, so thank you, uh, Scott, for reading this passage to us earlier, but I'm just going to reread now the key part, and we'll see if we can tie that to our experience. In Hebrews 11, starting at verse 8, it says this, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. He was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. That's uh, Abraham's son and grandson. It says this, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. Now, Abraham never reached his city. He only ever lived in a tent. Yeah, you know, he was a rich man by the standards of his day, yet he lived in a tent. So you might be asking, well, then what's the point uh, 
Why even wait? What, what's the value of the promises? Now, we've talked a lot in this session about how we face trials and that that's something that as Christians we should expect. And you'll remember we've seen it over and over again in the writings of Paul and of Peter and of James. All the passages we looked at earlier in this series are consider it pure joy when you face many trials. But you may be thinking now, so we're going to face all these trials and then we don't get what we're promised? It makes me think of a friend Fiona and I used to have when we lived in North London um, and she was maybe more honest than some of us and she just came right out one time and said what a lot of us often think. She said, well, what's the point of being a Christian if God doesn't give me what I want? Now, stated boldly, it sounds kind of funny, but do you know there's something about that? There, there is an honesty about that cry. So what's the solution? Well, we're going to read on in that same passage in Hebrews. Now, we're picking up halfway through verse 13, so straight where we finished before, talking about Abraham still and his son and grandson. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Now, obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. And that's why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So why did Abraham live in a tent despite being a rich man? Well, because he never got home. Because his home that he'd seen, that God had shown him, that he was aspiring to, that he was longing for, uh, is not of this earth. It just didn't exist on earth. You know, he may have lived on a particular patch of ground that's part of what we now call Israel, but that's not really the city that he was longing for. You know, it's not something built out of stones and mortar, but the city whose foundation God has laid, the home that God had prepared for him. So Abraham lived in a tent. Now, who else lives in a tent? All of us is the answer. Here's what Paul says, second letter to the Corinthians, beginning in chapter 5, he writes this. We know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, and that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Now Paul sees the body that we have now as being a temporary structure like a tent and looking ahead to not a tent in heaven, but a house in heaven is the words that he uses here. A house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself. In the eternal city that Abraham longed to reach, that is where again, where it's built by God himself. And this is why in the end, none of our waiting is in vain. All the things we wait for in this life, successfully or unsuccessfully, I'm not saying they don't matter. Of course, I'm not saying that. They matter desperately. Employment matters, health matters, all sorts of things matter. But actually, above and beyond that, and greater than all of that, is the city and the life that God has promised us. So if you ever feel like you don't belong here, do you know if you ever look around at the world, you see corruption in governments, you see disease, you see avoidable famines, you see wars, you might look at it all and think, this world doesn't feel like my home. The reason you feel that is because it's not. It's a staging post. We're living in a tent. And that's why Paul says elsewhere in Lessons of the Philippians, this phrase, our citizenship is in heaven. And I like that because it's not just saying this is where we're headed, but it, in a sense is where we actually belong. It's a little bit like um, if, uh, <laughs> I was going to say if Fiona and I go on holiday in France, now that's obviously not going to happen for a while, uh, COVID and all. But if we do, we may be living in France at a given moment, we might even splash out and stay in a bed and breakfast instead of a tent. But our citizenship is still in Britain. Now, we will be living in France for that period of time, but we belong in Britain. We're British. Our citizenship is in Britain. And yet Paul looks beyond that and says, actually, no, in some sense, I'm British. But in the end, my citizenship is in heaven. That's the place where I really belong. And that is true of all of us who have trusted Christ. So God has something much better for us than whatever it is we're waiting for now. You know, 
often the things that we pray for or ask for are a long life or a good life. What God has for us is eternal life. And what I want to get into my head, and I hope all of our heads, is that eternal life is better than this life. It's not just a continuation. It's not just more years like the years we have now. It's not just longer than a long life. It's not just better than a good life. It's both of those things to a degree that we can't begin to understand now. And that's why Paul wants us to focus on it, to look beyond this life to the next. When he says this, and this is in the first letters of the Corinthians, chapter 15, look it up, verses 19 and 20. Uh, he says this, If our hope in Christ is only in this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone. That's not what you'd expect him to say, is it? You maybe sometimes hear Christians say things like, well, you know, even if there was only this world now, it's still better to live a Christian life. Uh, and there's something in that. I'm not saying that's completely wrong. But what Paul actually says is we're to be pitied if our hope is in a future that, that isn't really there. And is it there? So does the idea of life after death sound like a comforting fairy tale? Does it sound like the kind of thing you might tell the kids when grandma dies? It's easy to slip into that way of thinking, isn't it? We live in a secular world, in a material world, the world we're in now, that demands our attention and our focus all the while on the things that are happening here and now in this world. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that we're called to something beyond it. But the question I want to ask you is this. Do we really think so little of God that we don't believe he can do anything beyond this world, this physical universe? I mean, the physical universe exists because God spoke it into being. Surely we don't think that he's constrained by it and that he can only uh, deal with us in the context of this universe. No. God, thinking about the song that Vesper sang a few weeks ago, God is bigger than the boogeyman. Here's a more important point, Vesper. God is bigger than the universe. Immeasurably bigger. So the fact that right now we happen to be on this particular ball of dirt... Uh, orbiting around this particular fusion reactor in the unfashionable western spiral arm of this galaxy. That kind of isn't important. All of that physical material stuff in the end will pass, will fade. And what God has for us is an eternal city whose foundations he himself has laid. So the resurrection is core to our faith and always has been, not just the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection that God has for all of us, lifted up in his wake, carried along with him as he is rose to life. And if I go back to that passage I, I started to read in 1 Corinthians 15, I sort of read half of, of that pair of verses. Let, let me read the whole thing this time. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world, Paul says. But he goes on to say, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead and he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. And that's what we're waiting for. Now, most of the things we're waiting for, we can't be confident of. We can want them, we can hope for them, we can wait for them, but we don't know what's going to happen. You might be waiting for a job, but the job you go and interview for, you maybe you're dependent on interviewers who have already decided who they want to give it to. Uh, you may be waiting for medical results, uh, and that's dependent on what your body is doing, which you don't have a, a whole ton of control over. Or you may be waiting to see the effect of treatments in a medical situation, but that depends on doctors and nurses who they want the best for you, but they can't always provide it. They, they can't provide every health outcome that we want. And of course, we're waiting for the end of the COVID crisis, but that's dependent in Britain on two main things. One is the competence of the government. The other is how well people behave, regular people. And neither of those are things that we would necessarily want to stake our lives on. So we're waiting for all these things. We might get them, we might not. But here's the thing. The great, great thing that we're waiting for, the great promise of eternal life, that rests on God himself. Not fallible medics, not corrupt politicians, uh, not a failing body, but on a God who is both great and good. And this is why I love the song that um, Fiona played in that song the other week. Lord, you are both great and good. Both those things are important. Because God is great, he is able to do the things that he promised. Because he is good, he will keep his promises. Both of those things are crucial. So in the end, all of us are waiting. And the thing we're waiting for 
is not to be found in this world, but it depends on an unshakable promise from one who is great to fulfil his promise and good that he will fulfil his promise. Now, finally, I want to say this. You may be asking, all right, Mike, but where's the application? What am I supposed to actually do? Well, what I want to say is the application for this is everywhere. If we can grasp this, if we can get it into our minds, that what God has for us is so immeasurably greater than anything we can ask or imagine in this life, it changes everything. It changes how we feel about everything, how we see everything. It changes everything we do. It, it wipes away forever the possibility of a Christianity that's just a sort of a hobby. Something we do on Sundays, like we might play Sunday League football or restore steam engines or something. That kind of Christianity doesn't fly once we see how great God's promise to us is. It becomes the heart and the focus and the destination of our lives because we see and trust the promise of the God who we trust. Now the church is a fine thing does all sorts of great things, social, social uh, elements and in, in binding all of us together and work that does in the community and all of that is great. But in the end, that's not what we're about. We're about a God who is great and good and about the incredible promise of eternal life that he has given us and that we're confidently waiting for. And the very last thing I want to say is this. I've been speaking mostly to members of the church, but anybody else who's watching this, uh, welcome. It's great to have you with us. If you don't know that promise, if you don't feel the reality of that, then please do talk to us. We'd love to uh, get to know you and to help you to see what we have seen and to receive the promise that we've received. So uh, drop us a line. You can email tim at fcchurch.co.uk or talk to any of us, really. Just drop in on Facebook, various groups. Uh, and it'd be lovely to talk to you. We would love you to live in the same blessing that we live in with this great and good God who has loved us from before the foundation of the physical universe and will love us long after it.